Oh, good. So I hope you can hear me now. No sound? You have a soundless teacher at the moment? Uh, can you hear me now? Still not? Yes, you can hear me now. And I'm no more a soundless teacher. But how wonderful it would be if most of your teachers just keep silent. Right, so now that you can hear me, I welcome you once again to a beautiful session that we're going to have this afternoon, and that too on poetry. Why is it beautiful? Because anything that gives you a starting advantage is a thing of beauty and a thing that you must value. Poetic, isn't it? Well, <clears throat> so today we're going to start with Birches and welcome beautiful people to the world of poetry. In the poem Birches, the poet Robert Frost is fascinated at the sight of birch trees that are arched. What do you understand by arched? Trees that are bent. Right? Some to the left and some to the right, among the straighter, taller trees of the birch that are white with patches of black on their branches. Now these trees generally grow like woods. They glow in clusters. So you would have a very big patch that comes up with birch trees. And then what happens here is that some of the trees would be on this side, some of the trees hanging towards that side, and between them you will find taller, stronger trees growing skywards. Good. So I, don't, I do not know whether the previous year's paper will be repeated or not, but I do know that there are a cluster of poems and a cluster of poetry, sorry, a cluster of poetry, cluster of prose, and the whole of the play that uh, were very much in your course the previous year. So there are chances that they might be somewhat portions that may be repeated, but you never know. So it is always better to be very well prepared. All right, so we were talking about the first glance of what Robert Frost sees. Who was Robert Frost? Robert Frost is the poet, the person who wrote this particular piece. And he has a special fascination with birches. The special fascination with birches inspires him to write a lot. Okay, well. But the truth is that ice storms that bend the birches. The fact is that it is the ice storms that bend the birches, not some fun-loving lad. What do you understand by country over here? By country, we do not mean a complete nation. But by country, we refer to rural and agricultural areas. Rural and agricultural lands can also be called the country. A very American poet, yes, a poet of New England. This particular poet belonged to the region of New England and was brought up in the country. Therefore, he has wonderful memories. He is nostalgic when he talks about the birch trees. But the truth is that the ice storms bend the birches. Because of the heavy snow that had settled on the branches weighing down the trees for long durations. Now, why do they bend? They bend because they are laden with snow. The snow weighs them down heavily. Not only that, what happens? On a sunny winter morning, one may see the snow settled on the branches that turn 
to ice after it rains. So powdery snow solidifies on the branches and the brushes of the birch tree, encasing it completely, right? As if it were wrapped in ice. And when the sun comes out after a rain, it becomes shinier. The ice shines in the sun rays. On sunny winter afternoon, morning, one may see the snow settled on the branches that turn into ice after it rains. He recollects, recollects, remembers. He remembers or recollects how the ice would glisten and shine in the sun. How the icicles would catch the sun's rays and reflect a prism of rainbow colors. So he's trying to tell you that all of a sudden, it would look as if the forest was colored in different prisms of rainbow. We are going to do Darkling Thrush after this, and we shall be taking up two more poems tomorrow. OK. And then there is somebody saying, on how to write answers, OK. That too. The clicking sound, what happens is, then there is a sound. When the breeze comes, then these branches hit one another. They move and stir and hit one another. The clicking sound that the ice-clad branches made due to the movement in the breeze. The shattered ice falling to the ground in heaps of crystal. And how would these heaps of crystal look? It seemed that the dome or the ceiling of the sky had fallen. Well, that was not the end of it. As all this heavy ice would shatter and fall to the floor of the forest, they would bring down with them the tender trunks of the birches, dragging the tender trunks with them, leaving the trees bent with leaves trailing like girls on all fours drying their hair in the sun. This is a simile. Here you have a simile. So please pay attention. In case you have to write something related to that, then you can quote this. You can quote this particular portion as a simile. Moving ahead. The poet repeats that he would prefer to have the birches bent due to the swinging of some country boys who had been sent to run errands and would inevitably swing on the birches that came that way. What kind of errands? Errands such as fetching the cows. So when we move further, the poet says that he would rather not have the ice storms bend the birches. Kehta hai ki usko ye zyada pasand aayega ki bachcho ne jhool jhool kar unko jhuka diya. Halanki baraf bhi un par sundar lagti hai, par baraf ke niche girne se jo wo peer jhukte hain, उससे ज्यादा अच्छा होता कि हर एक पेड़ सिर्फ इसलिए झुका होता कि उसको किसी लड़के ने झूल झूल कर झूल झूल कर झुका दिया। Yes, the birches being a reminiscent of the speaker's boyhood days. Another thing, his nostalgia and beautiful memory of his childhood days. So the poet repeats that he would prefer to have the birches bent due to swinging of some country boys rather than snow. Who had been sent to run errands and would inevitably swing on the birches that came that way. Errands such as fetching the cows. What are errands? Chores. Errands are chores or work. Those of you who may have a problem can understand. The birches bring back childhood memories that are so common to boys 
raised far from the cities. The poet himself was a boy raised in the countryside. So for him, the birches have got a special place, just like most of the boys brought up on the countryside of American, the New, Eng uh, the New England state of the America. Unlike city boys, the boys' games would the boys' game would not be baseball, but a sport that could be undertaken alone and throughout the year. He also says that why was it that climbing of the birch tree? It was not a matter of affordability. I will explain that. This is what I am explaining. He may or may not have been able to afford it, but the practice of playing baseball was not prevalent in the countryside. What was more easily available were forests, birch trees, farms, and open areas. A baseball player would require a team, but here he clarifies a sport that could be undertaken alone throughout the year, right? a sport that could be taken alone throughout the year for which he would not require special facilities, special equipment, and a team. That's how most of the village boys would play. Right? Uh, Ma'am, you're too slow. Please explain quickly. Well, in case you are feeling bored, you may please move on to another channel. I will go at my pace. He loves to imagine this boy swinging and conquering every single tree on his father's property, not stopping till he had mastered the arch of bird swinging, knowing exactly when to go up and swing down, learning how not to make the tender branches snap. This particular point tells you of the skills required by birch climbers. So what are the skills required? He loves to imagine this boy swinging and conquering every single tree on his father's property, not stopping till he had mastered the art of birch swinging, knowing exactly when to go up and swing down, learning how not to make the tender branches snap, mastering the ability to climb, and balance with poise while maintaining composure. Now let's look at some of the words here that will actually help you in case you have to explain. So mastering the ability to climb, balancing with poise, and maintaining composure. These were a few things that unknowingly swingers of birches would learn. Even in adult life, these things will always come in handy and unknowingly, the boys were already learning this skill. It is fascinating to imagine oneself climbing on the birch, to be suspended in midair, then being brought down gently to the earth. Especially in times of stress, when one seems to be running directionless, when one seems to be running directionless through woods where a twig might cause the eye to weep. The poet refers to, here is the reference to hardships of adulthood. This particular portion refers to the hardships of adulthood. When one is an adult, then what happens? especially in times of stress when one seems to be running directionless through woods where a twig might cause the eye to weep, where there are times one would want to weep. And then he says, challenges of adulthood that can become overbearing at times. This is with reference to all the challenges that adulthood may pose. The thought of climbing up swinging out to be suspended in the air itself is liberating. 
But here this word is extremely important. The thought of even being able to do that brings a sense of liberation from present worries. But the poet clarifies that fate must not misunderstand his wish to leave earth forever. He would want to be relieved of his burdens for a while, but surely would want to return to earth to shoulder his responsibilities. So he does not want to be taken high above and never allowed to be come down. He would rather be taken up and be brought down so that he can come back to earth where his home and his heart lies. Okay? Now, cause a change in, okay, we are talking of William Wordsworth. Okay. So clicking over here is basically, if you want to use it as a figure of speech, I really don't know how you would use that as a figure of speech, but clicking uh, is simply telling you about uh, the touch of two branches when they are encased with eyes. When they are brittle, then they make a click-click sound like two tumblers of glass or crystal touching one another. He is certain that earth is the only place where one would find true love and contentment. He is very certain that he must return to earth not only to take up his responsibilities, but also to receive love, contentment from his home and the people around him, as he knows no other place that is more suitable to human beings. <clears throat> okay? Right. The poem is written in blank verse. What we have to understand first is that the poem is written in blank verse. Fate is personified and we can give a simile, trailing their leaves on the ground like girls on their hands and knees that throw their hair before them over their heads to dry in the sun. So there are three figures of speech that I was able to bring out here. This is the style of the poem. So well, two figures of speech. However, this is the style in which the poem has been written. It has been done in this. And fate is, of course, per personified because he says, may fate not misunderstand me. So that is what it says. And that is why it can be called that. Uh, Ma'am, now the limit is 150 words for five marks. So should we stick to that? Yes, it is important to stick to the word limit. It is always helpful if you follow the rules. Uh, do we have to learn about the poets as well? You may learn maybe one or two important things. That's all. You do not need to know too much about the poet. You'd, even if you know, you cannot write too much about the poet. It is better to focus on the contents of the poem that the poet has written. They do not want you to elaborate too much on the poet. They want you to elaborate more on his work or her work. You can simply give a reference. Like we gave a reference that Robert Frost was brought up in the country and that is why he had a special connection with the birch woods. That's more than enough. Sometimes in poems like the Darkling Thrush or poems like um, the Dover Beach, the poet is bothered about the changing era, the times that are changing from medieval to modern. It was a very major change. So 
how did they get, get affected by it? They were unhappy, they were worried. That's more than enough. In case it was a click, click, it was just one clinking. I don't think that there is a certain figure of speech. However, it comes in the descriptive analysis of anything. In case you talk about uh, things like uh, sound, sight, smell, feel, all these things, then it adds a lot of variety here. Right. Okay, we shall do it at the end for those of you who want to. Now let us, uh, con C directed writing is, huh? Ma'am, con C directed writing is. I don't understand this question. Okay. As far as the clicking is concerned, it is comes only as a sound. Like the shattering of ice. These are the sounds he has given to enhance the quality and imagery of the poem. So it all comes under imagery, if you want me to explain that. When we talk of imagery, then you have got visual imagery, and then you have auditory imagery. So visual imagery, imagery which is visual will talk about things that you see. Auditory imagery will talk about the sounds that you can hear. You can put it under that category, okay? <clears throat> right. Now, let's talk about this particular poem, The Darkling Thrush. Uh, can you see it? I think you having you'll have a problem in seeing it. It's still not visible. Right. Now I think we're getting somewhere. Yes. Now it's visible. I think you can make more use of less light. <sighs> Sometimes less is more. Now let's come to the darkling thrush. For those of you who wanted to write along, I will go back. I will scroll back again, and you can take your points from there. Okay? Describe some imageries which Hardy used in his poem, The Darkling Thrush. What do they signify? Also, mention the figures of speech that have been used. Right? The poem begins with the speaker leaning on the coppice gate. It is the winter season and everything around him. All right, please discuss about Victorian era and the darkling thrush. I'll do that also. Without that, this poem will not be complete. So we shall be doing that as well. The poem begins with the speaker leaning on the coppice gate. It is the winter season and everything around him is grey as a ghost. 
everything is covered in frosty snow. It is gradually growing dark in the evening, which he compares to the weakening eye of day as the sun begins to set. Further, he compares the tangled vine stems to the strings of broken lyre. The stems of the leafless branches of plants and trees looked mangled. Here it is tangled. Here I have used the word mangled. What do we understand by mangled? Ek dusre mein uljhe hue. I will talk about the important poems also. Please don't worry about that. That will also happen by and by. Right. So in case you want me to go along with the text, I can go along with that also. I leant upon a coppice gate when frost was spectre gray and winter's dregs may desolate the weakening eye of day. The tangled bind stems scored the sky like strings of broken lyre and all mankind that haunted nigh had sought their household fires. Okay, so he talks about leaning on a coppice gate and it is the winter season where everything around him is ghastly and grey because everything is covered in frosty snow which for a while looks white but then after that dampens the spirit. It is gradually growing dark in the evening which he compares to the weakening eye of day as the sun begins to set. And dregs means remains, the few remnants. He is talking about the few remnants. Those are being called dregs. Further, he compares uh, the tangled bind stems to strings of a broken lyre. What would be a broken lyre? A broken lyre was an instrument like a harp. It was a harp-like instrument which had a lot of strings, okay? Poetic devices will always come and uh, it is better to know them, okay? So, the land's sharp features, all right, we are still, so we talk about the harp and then what does he say? Why do they look like tangled bind stems? Why do they look like a strings of broken lyre? Because they look equally disappointing. They seem to be entwined in one another, completely leafless, and so they look bad. The stems of leafless branches of plants and trees looked mangled, uljhi hui, in a way that they remind the poet of a broken harp. It adds to the gloom of the dead environment where there is no music or joy. At dusk, as dusk approaches, people have returned to their homes looking for warmth and the comfort of their fireplace. So this is in regard to, and all mankind that haunted nigh has sought their household fires, okay? Desolation and isolation. Desolate is uh, more lonely. Isolation is when you decide to be alone. But desolation is a situation where everything looks lonely and forlorn. Another word is forlorn. We have done this already, so let us move further. So these people who had been walking through the desolate land, the lonely outstretches of land, have all gone back in. Even they have deserted the area and gone back. <coughs> then, the land's sharp features seem to be the sanctuary's corpse outlent. He has crypt the cloudy canopy, the wind his death lament. The ancient pulse of germ and birth was shrunken hard and dry. And every spirit upon earth seemed fervorless as I. 
This does not actually mean the destruction of civilization, but this actually means a sense of abandonment, as if things were being abandoned, people going away, people not liking it, people unable to tolerate it. Okay? So, the barren land before him looks like a bony skeleton spread out, reminding him of the sanctuary that has just ended. All right? That's why it is called the sanctuary's corpse. It seems to be like the dead body of the, di of the dead sanctuary. Hmm? And the land's sharp features, here he's talking about the barrenness the barren land okay why is it barren because in when it snows for too long nothing survives his crypt the cloudy canopy all right so what is the crypt his coffin and his grave put together seem to be his crypt Okay, the wind its death lament and on the grave the wind cries blowing from here to there whistling away in the storm. It seems as if even the wind seems to be lamenting the death of the sanctuary that has just passed. Okay, now let's move further. <clears throat> the dense gray clouds look like a shroud and the whistling wind cries in sorrow. The harsh winter has stalled. Stalled over here means stopped. The ancient cycle of birthing animals and plants as the ground is hard and dry. Why do they say animals and birth? The pulse of germ and birth. Germination is for plants and birthing is for animals. All right? So not just one, but he's referring to two kinds of things. Okay? So the poet perceives every being to be sorrowful and melancholic and as fervorless as himself. Since the poet himself is not in a good mood, and everything around him is gray, desolate, sad, barren. So they are both, they both get together and make the poet feel even less enthusiastic, less comfortable, more sorrowful, more thoughtful and pensive about the future that he is about to face. And then a change. At once a voice arose among the bleak twigs overhead in full-hearted evensong of joy illimited. This is not an elegy. This is not an elegy. This is neither a mournful poem. The first half of it is gloomy and the second half of it is full of joy. Right? So, what happens? A change. Suddenly a small thrush that is aged and battered due to the blizzard. What is a blizzard? A blizzard is a snowstorm. Due to a blizzard erupts into shrill singing that breaks the deadly silence of the gloomy day. It seems to fling his soul upon the growing darkness which suggests that there is still hope to change for the better and that the coming new era might not be as frightful for people. So it is ringing in hope. It is announcing that not all is lost. Things can become weak for a while, but it is actually for us 
to take it in our stride and do better. That is the kind of message that this particular little darkling baby is doing. So again, why is it called the darkling thrush? We will also discuss that. He is filled with hope and a spark of joy warms him, warms his heart due to the brave little thrush's cheerful singing. So from a very serious note of desolation, gloominess, mourning and hopelessness, the poet's spirits begin to lift. It talks how does he get the courage from somewhere the spark of life is seen and it is just a tiny thrush that braves the winter and has the courage to sing. It seems to be calling in a new era, rejoicing at the coming of a new era rather than mourning the dying era. So you can take it in this manner also. The shrill singing heralds the new era, calls in the new era. And does not seem to be bothered about the era gone by. We can also safely say that. The shrill singing of the little thrush heralds a new era and does not seem to be bothered about the era that has gone by. Right? Illimited joy, unlimited joy. Nature versus man, right? So uh, the thrush also represents caroling. That is a very good point you have put forward. Generally, the last week of any particular year is the Christmas season. So then it begins uh, from Christmas and the celebrations continue till the new year. So definitely we can say that the shrill singing also is like a caroling for Christmas and the New Year. Coppice means, yes, a wooden gate generally at the back, all right? Generally at the back of any property. Not the front gate, but the back gate. So it is generally smaller, you can lean on it. The sun seemed to be fading and dying, yes. So caroling in this season, do not call it caroling of Christmas, but ca call it the caroling of the season of celebrations. You can call it that. Okay, so... Uh, Basically, this is what this poem is all about. Ye poem hamko, for the benefit of those who would like to understand a little bit in, English, in Hindi also, it is simply wo hamara dhyan un sab cheezon ki taraf khichti hai jo pehle poet dekhta hai, jo Thomas Hardy ko nazar aata hai. Har taraf baraf, har taraf mayusi, har taraf pedo ke upar pattiya nahi तो वो भी अगली लग रहे हैं और जमीन पे कोई पेड़ पौधे नहीं बच पा रहे क्योंकि बर्फ हर किसी चीज को खत्म कर चुकी है लोग जो कि थोड़े बहुत नजर आ रहे थे वो भी अब नजर नहीं आते क्योंकि शाम होने वाली है और सूरज बुझ रहा है because of the approach of the dusk the sun is becoming dimmer तो ये लोग चले जाते हैं सब के सब लोग मैदानों को छोड़कर अपने घरों में चले जाते हैं 
और ऐसे में नज़ारा और भी ज़्यादा मायूस लगने लगता है टॉमस हार्डी को लगता है कि हर चीज़ रो रही है हर चीज़ मातम मना रही है हर चीज़ सैड है लेकिन इन सब के बीच में टॉमस हार्डी की सैडनेस बढ़ रही है उसको इससे कंफर्ट नहीं मिल रहा है उसको इससे डिसकंफर्ट मिलता है कब उसका ये भ्रम टूटता है उसका ये भ्रम तब टूटता है जब एक छोटी सी चिड़िया सारे स्नो स्टॉम्स को ब्रेव करती हुई इतना करेज लेके आती है कि वो जोर जोर से गाने लगती है शाम के समय जब कोई नहीं दिख रहा जब सूरज डूब रहा है ये छोटी सी चिड़िया सुंदर आवाज में गाने लगती है और इसके गाने से ऐसा लगता है कि सारी मायूसी का माहौल खत्म होता जा रहा है द साइलेंस इज बींग ब्रोकन ऑल्सो एंड और उससे क्या होता है कि पोएट uh, को थोड़ी खुशी मिलती है और आगे के लिए उम्मीद भी जगाती जगती है उसके लिए यस द थ्रश रिप्रेजेंट्स द साइन ऑफ होप राइट नाउ लेट अस टॉक अबाउट द फिलोसफी व्हाट इज इट एक्चुअली ऑल अबाउट वी हैव नॉट येट फिनिश्ड देयर इज स्टिल मोर I've made it as big as I can so that it will become clearer. Right. Thomas Hardy has used many images related to nature in this poem. It speaks It speaks about the turmoil in people's lives and how everything is becoming mechanized and why new ideas and the ways of life seem to baffle the poet he is perplexed to see that there is no value for emotions and everything is factual people are becoming factual over here refers to practical less emotional and more practical but the little thrush gives him hope and the strength to welcome the herald of the new century all right so this is going to carve out the central idea if you want you may please take a note of these things it sums up the emotion behind this particular poem so i repeat thomas hardy has used many images related to nature in this poem it speaks about the turmoil in people's lives and how everything is becoming mechanized let me write a little more mechanized with the dawn of the i'm sorry of the modern era okay new ideas and ways of life seem to baffle the poet what do we understand by baffle confuse and disturb when something confuses and disturbs then it is called baffling he is perplexed to see again disturb to see that there is no value for emotions and everything is factual it is becoming very very practical but the little thrush gives him hope and the strength to welcome the herald of the new century the coming in of new age right in the victorian era many things depended only on faith god church pope whatever they said was considered to be law whatever they said was considered to be good practice but with the inventions coming in with scientific knowledge coming in the world had started to change but people of the older generation were not acceptable to such things they found it easier to remain the way they were sharp features uh, can be yes if you want to put it that way hills but i would also put it as when there is no vegetation then even the slightest rocks 
inclines and declines become ugly. So here, sharp features don't ref refer to beauty, but they refer to ugliness. <clears throat> now, alliteration. You wanted, to, you wanted me to tell you more about figures of speech. Her, here you have it. Please pay attention so that you can. Alliteration in this particular poet, his crypt the cloudy canopy. Why is it an alliteration? There is a C here, crypt the cloudy canopy. So that is why this is called an alliteration. He has used the consonant C repeatedly. Talking of simile, the tangled bind stem scored the sky like strings of broken lyres, like, as if they were. That's why like, the blackened, twisted and leafless plants seemed like scattered strings of a broken string instrument. So this can be your simile, the tangled bind stems scoring the sky like strings of a broken lyre. So they are very similar to a broken string instrument. And a broken string instrument is again a disappointing sight. It's not a happy sight. Science versus religion, yes. So Darwinism was coming in, industrialization was coming in, women's liberation was coming in, women had started to understand that they also had a place and wanted Maybe not very openly, but they had started to express themselves also. In the first half of the poem, he is hopeless, sorrowful, and lonely. But then the, the, he concentrates on the thrush. And the thrush has an effect on him. Nature has a different effect. Nature makes him feel sad. But the little thrush makes him feel joyful and hopeful. So you can divide it that way. Nature ki jitne bhi elements hain, wo usko dukhi karte hain. Kyunki severe winter hai. Aur, aur severe winter mein sab kuch mar jata hai. Spring mein dubara zinda honne lagta hai, par winter mein bohut zyada kuch nahi dikhta hai, sirf snow snow dikhti hai, aur wo bohut boring hoti hai. Or usse bohat logon ko bada emotional setbacks ha hota hai. They don't like it. So probably Thomas Hardy was already feeling low. But on that particular evening, when the sanctuary was about to end, he started associating both the things. Then the thrush, the living thing, makes him happy. The elements make him sad, but the living thing makes him happy. You can do it that way, that will ease it for you. Now, let's talk about the metaphor, the weakening eye of day. Instead of calling it the su setting sun, he calls it the weakening eye of day. This has been used in place of setting sun. That is why it is a metaphor. Here the sun is compared to an eye, factor lending visibility. The sanctuary's corpse outlent. This is another metaphor. So if you're asked for a metaphor, I have given it here. The sanctuary's corpse outlent. The ending of the century is compared to a corpse. Personification, again, this will come in this and in this both. He had no expectations from the new generation and he had no hope that faith would have a place and value in the changing world. Right? Okay? Now we have done these two poems. Tomorrow I shall be taking up uh, again, more poems. And there was a very repeated question from many of you. 
Ma'am, which poem do you think would be important? I think you must focus a lot on John Brown and you must focus a lot on dolphins. These two poems have just come into uh, the curriculum, uh, your present syllabus, and therefore it is a good practice in case you practice them well. Right? Dover Beach is important, no doubt. But there have been repeated questions on Dover Beach and uh, the darkling thrush, of course. However, the darkling thrush and the Dover Beach uh, are always very classical poems. John Brown and the dolphins are comparatively contemporary, not very old. They don't belong to the Victorian era. They belong very much to our own era. The poet had no hope for the generation as he thought that the fertility from the ancient time is now to be, not the fertility from the ancient time, the, uh, not the fertility of the ancient time, rather he's ref he, he says that the severe cold and the desolation and the hopelessness seemed to be stopping new things from coming back to life. Right? All right. So is there, uh, how many pages do we have to write for 10 marks? Uh, again, a question is not very appropriate. You will not go on pages. You will go on word limits. I keep on saying, for one word answers, for one mark answers, you will write about 30 words, not more than that. Don't try to go too much. Then for five marks, 150 words. And for 10 marks, write approximately 250 words. Okay, so let's go back again to the birches. Some of you wanted if there is anything that I can help you with. If this is what you're writing about, or if this is what you're writing about, I really don't know. But if that can help you. Yes, about hope, why the thrush is referred to as darkling. Yes, a very, very good uh, question. I missed out on that one. You can please take a note of the explanation that I'm giving you here. It's a very relevant question that she has put up or he has put up. I really wonder who it was just to entertain. Well, not for entertainment, but for notes and marks. Let me tell you that the darkling thrush has got relevance uh, as the fact that this particular thrush seemed to appear from nowhere when it was getting dark, gloomy, and hopeless. This little thrush is born from within that darkness. Is it appears from within the darkness, and that is why it is called a produce of the darkness. From the dark, there rises a hope in the form of the thrush. That is why it is called the darkling thrush. In your darkest of moments, when you see a spark of hope, when you see a spark of change, then uh, that is what has been signified over here. Jaise ki Hindi mein hum log kehte hain ki jab raat sabse zyada kali hoti hai, और हम सोचते हैं कि कब सुबह हो कब सुबह हो मगर जब रात सबसे ज्यादा काली होती है तब हमें समझ लेना चाहिए 
कि बस सुबह आ गई है इन द सेम मैनर द डार्कलिंग थ्रश सिग्निफाइज द एंड ऑफ डार्कनेस एंड द राइजिंग ऑफ होप it see it is a child of the darkness but it is bright and hopeful right oh you want me to write the answer okay let me try writing it for you i will do that as well see from the darkness all of a sudden i arose okay right if you can put this as a question what is the significance of the poet's name the darkling thrush or what did the poet want to convey through by giving the poem a name the darkling thrush so here's your answer i'm going up all right when darkness seem to be
it's not fitting here. I'm going up. It was, after all, a bright child of the darkness. Therefore, he called it the darkling thrush. You can add that much by yourself. And therefore, he called it the darkling thrush. So I hope that answers your question. And I shall be closing the session after you have noted this down, we shall meet tomorrow with another set of poems. And a set means two more poems. For now, you can go back to your studies. And I wish you all the very best for your preparation. All the best. For those of you who are on uh, PB English 24, well, we shall start with guest paper two for English language at six. That's an announcement. This one is going to be solved. Important topic, topics in directed writing, please come prepared with um, reports. Please be prepared with proposals, because they're scoring, and generally, uh, examiners prefer to give them. <laughs>